Hey folks, greetings from my quarantine hotel room in Hong Kong. I've just returned from a trip in the States and saw the news that the new Hasselblad X2D 100C has been announced. Now, I have to say in full disclosure up front, whilst I've never been employed by Hasselblad, I'm not an ambassador or anything like that, I was, and kind of still am, an absolute fanboy for the ergonomics of the X1D range. I think as a piece of design, how it feels in the hand, it may be the most beautiful camera I've ever laid hands on or eyes on. So putting that disclosure out there, and I'll go one step further that I think in the past, I was wearing rose-colored glasses and at times overlooked and kind of forgave some of the shortcomings of the camera because of the ergonomics and the beauty. So by doing this today without the camera here in my hand, I actually think it's a better thing. I'll still be doing my very best to get one in to do a proper hands-on and to give you my thoughts and to put it head-to-head -head with some serious contenders to see how it lines up. But today I wanted to talk you through how this fits into the range. We had the X1D 50C, then the second generation. Now we've got this one and also how it fits in with the H6D 100C, which has been their flagship for years and years and years now, which is the real medium format 100 megapixel camera that's currently on the market. Now I've been really lucky over the years to use all the different Hasselblad cameras, all the different Fuji GFX cameras, the Leica S range as well, and some of the phase one equipment as well. I'm actually kind of the target market for this kind of camera in a way. You might think it's just for museum reproduction work or for, you know, Annie Leibovitz or whatever, but the reality is I think the most of these cameras get sold to middle-aged guys who have the income, who are total gear whores, who have been shooting for some time or just getting started and have the cash and want the best. They want to play with that equipment and being that I'm a portrait photographer, I can, you know, fit that into my workflow and it's a real option for me. Now, over the years, I've seriously considered going in on a medium format system. If the Leica S3 had had a decent autofocus system, I probably would have gone into that. I've seriously considered several of the different Fuji ones, and I was this close to buying the X1D50 Mark II back in the day. But when, you know, it came time to actually put my credit card down and fork out all of those thousands of dollars, I had to come to terms with the fact that Whilst the design is great, the image quality is beautiful, and for me, yes, the having a leaf shutter rather than the traditional shutter, I like that design. The speed was just not okay for me. They said that going from the X1D 50C to the second generation, it made it twice as fast, but it was still unacceptably slow in my opinion. Can't find it specifically, but I have a feeling I saw that they're saying the new one, the X2D, is about 50% faster again. To be honest, it's really hard to get a sense of what that means. From what I've read from DP Review, startup time is still around two seconds. I, ha I, I know the reason that there's the, the slower startup time because it has all of the color lookup tables that it loads ahead of time. So I kind of get that, but it's really going to be how responsive is it in the field. The touchscreen was a lot better, the focus was better on the second generation, but it still just wasn't enough for what I would personally want. Now, I would be astounded if it's going to be as fast focusing as say the Fuji GFX 100S, but please blow me away, I would love to find that out. I just want to run through some of the top line things here that the new camera includes that is maybe making this, if it's you know responsive as well, almost a dream camera for me, but also temper it with a couple of reality checks for you guys. Now, looking at the specifications of this camera, it really, you know, it is expensive. We can't get away from that. You're looking at $8,200 for the body only. Serious money. Um, haven't seen it confirmed, but rumors are that it's based around the same 102 megapixel sensor that's in the GFX100S, those cameras. 
Interesting thing though, they're not saying it's 102, they're saying it's 100, and also this one's base ISO is 64, not 100 like the Fuji, so I'm not sure, but it does look like that. It's a true 16-bit uh, sensor now, rather than the you know, kind of interpolated one that the 50C was using. Other main things, it's now using phase detect autofocus. It's almost 2023, 20, about time. 294 points with about 88 or 90% coverage. Five axis in-body image stabilization that they're saying is good for seven stops, which is actually more than Fuji advertise. Um, it's got still their 5.76 million dot screen, uh, EVF, which is fantastic. The rear 3.6 inch screen, which is 2.36 million dots, again, really high res, is now uh, tilting just in the one direction. That from what I've seen online, the touch screen works really nicely now and the physical buttons down the side rotate with it. The top mode dial has been replaced by a little EVF, uh, sorry, a little LCD screen. And there's no nipple for moving your focus point around like a joystick. So essentially you have to touch the back screen, which means that screen's always going to be active, which I guess you're gonna to have to be careful plonking your nose up against it. Having the tilting screen though, you could really use it as like a viewfinder style camera now. Other big things, it's moved from dual SD cards to using a single CF Express, but it includes a terabyte of internal storage. I would imagine that any SSD is going to keep up with that. Now, unlike the X1D 50C Mark II that was released with a video mode on the dial, but no video mode to be updated later, and then there was a pretty shonky patch put out that brought some video capability, this one is just foregoing it altogether. Now, if this is the same sensor as the Fuji one, we know that that is actually capable of beautiful, high quality video. My guess is, one, the engineering cost, but two, that this body is so small and svelte, there may just be heating issues if they were to try and include the video there. So they're making it no video. Now, you can defend that saying, this is an ultimate stills camera, do you need video, da 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 da. That's going to be down to you. For myself, for a camera like this, I probably could look around it. Again, I'd be wearing the rose-colored glasses and forgiving things because I love the industrial design. But on the other hand, when I'm out shooting, there are times where being able to just switch to video and get some slow motion 4K or higher resolution footage is a big plus for me, and I personally would miss that. Otherwise, I think this is a really interesting option. Now, before we get into the reality checks, do me a favor and please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and turn on notifications for two reasons. One, about two thirds of my video views come from non-subscribe people. And two, YouTube messed up at some point and people who were previous whoever, previously subscribed and had notifications on have been letting me know that they found they were no longer subscribed or that notifications had been turned off. So please take a moment right now to just check are your notifications on. I've got some really cool live content coming soon that you'll need notifications on to catch it. Couple of things that you need to keep in mind. So if you're comparing say this body to the GFX 100S, the GFX is like $6,000, this is 8,200. You know, that's uh, a third difference in price. That's not an insignificant price difference. But it's really once you start looking at the lenses that you're going to notice the biggest differences. Because the Hasselblad doesn't have an internal mechanical shutter, it's using leaf shutter lenses. They're more complex, you physically have the shutter inside the lens. That does mean more complex and more expensive lenses and it really, really adds up. Taking a look at this little comparison, I put together a just a cart showing you if you were to get kind of an overall kit. Now this is the kind of thing Fuji lovers like to do to show you how ridiculous things can get, but essentially putting in their 80 mil portrait lens from each brand, the body, uh, standard zoom. Now, to be fair, the Hasselblad is a little bit faster and a little bit broader range and then a 45 mil cheaper lens, you can see that the Fuji kit in total comes to $12,296. Serious money for one camera and three lenses, 
but the Hasselblad is coming in at $19,318, a much bigger price. A couple of other things you want to think about if you are comparing them just like that. Having no mechanical shutter in the camera actually has a huge impact if you're wanting to use third-party lenses. So if you wanted to just get, for example, full-frame camera lenses above about 55mm and up, so 55, 85, 105, tend to have enough coverage to actually cover this sensor. So if you wanted to use one of them and manually focus it, you can do that with the Fujis easily because you have the shutter in the camera. With the Hasselblad though, the readout time is really slow. You'll have to use an electronic shutter and then it kind of makes it almost impossible. You can get some shots, but you're going to find you get a lot of warping in a lot of your frames. That's just how it is. You can adapt like the H6 style lenses using Hasselblad's own adapter and then, you know, it's, it's something, but you have to keep in mind as well as having more expensive lenses with Hasselblad, you're going to have a much more limited range of aftermarket lenses that you can consider realistically using it for a lot of different kinds of work. Another thing, and this goes for Fuji as much as Hasselblad, is that, and I've said this so many times and people call me a hater, but I just wanna make it clear, this is kind of a broader context, this is medium format, but if you're talking about sensor size, it's still absolutely baby medium format. So I'm not going to go down even the whole film path again, but let's just take a quick look at this little graphic I put together. If you take a look at a full frame sensor, that is 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters in overall area. So you multiply them and you're getting 864 as the total surface area. If you go up to the X2D, which is the same sensor size as the X1D, as the Fuji cameras, as the old Pentax medium format, that's 43.8 by 32.9 or 1441. Now that's a significant difference, 67% larger. The reason I'm bringing this up now about that this is still baby medium format is because I've seen a lot of people talking about how the X2D is encroaching or maybe taking the flagship title from Hasselblad's flagship, the H6D 100C, 100 megapixel camera that I had the good fortune to shoot with in Peru years ago. This is a camera that's been out for a long time. It's real medium format, and it's still on the smaller side of medium format. For that kind of a camera, you're looking at 53.4 by 40 millimeters, or 2136, which is another 50% larger in terms of overall service area, or 48%, than the other ones. So just keep that in mind if you're wanting that medium format look where you get the reverse crop factor where you know you are that much closer to your subjects, you get an even shallower depth of field, you're getting a lot of the way there with these kind of baby medium formats, but it's not the same kind of size as the H6D. So Yes, I would say overall the image quality coming off the new X2D will probably outperform the H60 just because so many years of technology have come in between the two. But if you're just thinking about sensor size and the benefits that come with that, keep this graphic in mind. That's not necessarily a hater thing, it just is what it is. If you look at the uh, Leica S2 and S3, they have a different format for their sensor, a different aspect ratio, but they're basically the same size as the X2D and the Fuji sensors in terms of surface area as well. So look, I am actually dying to get this in and check out. I have to say though, two years, three years, water under the bridge, between the X1D Mark II and this one, the boat has probably flown for me in terms of wanting one for myself. Um, it's really a, a luxury object for me and something that I'm sure is an astoundingly capable machine if it suits your needs. But my interest is how, how does that work in reality? So the other ones in particular applications, the speed wasn't an issue, but for a lot of applications, it was an issue. 
does the speed improvement now make it realistically and not with rose colored glasses, not forgiving it its shortcomings because it's so beautiful or because it's handmade in Sweden or because it's been to the moon or blah, 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 blah. Objectively, looking at how it performs in the field, does it do all of the different genres? Can you use it for street? Is it responsive? Can you shoot moving subjects? Because whilst I am tough on all the cameras that I review, Fuji up pretty much there. I still think they have some QC issues. It, the AF isn't perfect, but from what I've seen, they're so far ahead of the rest of the medium format or large format as they like to call it for some reason. Um, there's just no question about that. So when you put that whole equation together, the price, the design, the lenses, the aspect ratio, the, you know, the new features, the built-in SSD, all of that stuff, it's going to be an entirely personal decision that comes down to you, your needs, and <laughs> your bank account on whether it's going to work for you. Um, so let me know what you think of this. Let me know what you think of the new specs. If I've been rambling like a crazy person in this video, let me know. I'm quite jet lagged coming off a 15 hour time zone change. Um, and I will get that in to test out as soon as possible. I'm in touch with Hasselblad. Hopefully I can get one from them. If not, B&H Photo will probably come through with one for me once they're available. Thanks guys. Please do like and subscribe. I'll see you soon.